The Big Ten and the SEC get together four times during uh, postseason play here with, of course, a college football playoff appearance and including this matchup that we're going to feature here for the next few minutes on our Iowa Hawkeyes live show that comes your way each and every Tuesday at 530 Eastern, 430 Central, where it counts. Hawkeyes and Wildcats of Kentucky get together in the Citrus Bowl. we got Corey Brad, of course who makes this all run here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And we would invite you to head on over there from the Hawkeye of the Storm and join Corey for Iowa men's and women's basketball as well as football and a little special guest tonight that we will introduce in just a second. Corey, how you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. Um, be doing better if, if I'd heard anything related to portal news for Iowa in the quarterback sphere. But I'm, I'm sure Iowa fans are tired of me talking about this. So we got we got Kevin for a while. We'll we'll talk more substance here, and then maybe we can go on some rants when he leaves. So, but I'm doing good. How are you, Kevin? Uh, I'm doing good. Thank you guys so much for uh, uh, inviting me on. Um, like I said, Kentucky and Iowa. I've, I've been excited. Um, uh, Mark and I, you know, we talk. I do bowl predictions. You know, for for last word on college football. And, and you know, every year at some point, anybody that does bowl predictions always tries to get Kentucky and Iowa together at some point because of the whole, you know, the Mark Stoops, the Mark Stoops bowl thing for lack of a better term. And, and this year it, it, it finally worked out. And, um, uh, you know, on this end here in Lexington, everybody's really, really excited about this game and um, can't wait until, um, till January 1st. So um, let's go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, no, and I'm, I've said this, Mark, I'm excited about this game. I know fans really, the, the excitement when you lose 42 to three in the big 10 title game, um, excitement for another trip to Florida isn't going to be there, but it is Iowa's first trip to Orlando since 05, which was a memorable game, of course. Um, and I, I do have a lot of respect for Mark Stoops um, for obvious reasons. And um, there, there's really not an SEC program that I respect as much as Kentucky. Just, And that's because of Mark. But um, I think it's a fascinating matchup, and uh, we, can, we can get into why. But I, I'm excited for it. So we'll remind everyone, as we typically do, leave those comments and questions in the live chat. Enjoy yourself and uh, certainly hit the like button. And again, it's uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm, as we'll put the banner up here from time to time and head on over there for men's and women's basketball and football, of course, uh, that Corey covers on a daily basis and Kevin McGuffey from Last Word on college football. So I have the honor of talking to you two gentlemen on a regular basis. So this works best when I get out of the way and uh, let you guys uh, knock out the matchup. So let's start here. Uh, Kevin, we've got, of course, a 90 plus percent uh, Iowa Hawkeyes audience here that uh, probably isn't too familiar with Kentucky football. So give us a, a look into Mark Stoops uh, project that he has risen from the ashes here to make an SEC contender. <laughs> yeah. Um, I said, Mark Stoops his ninth year here at Kentucky and, um, you think about from where where this program was when he took over when Joker Phillips was fired, um, you know, two and ten those first couple of years, and then has just steadily brought, you know, brought this program up to um, where it's you know probably the second second to third best team in the SEC East every year. Um, a lot of that has to do uh, with with the uh, the uptick in recruiting. Um, they're just getting better, you know. Quite frankly, just getting better players in here. And um, but as far as you know, twenty twenty one goes, the, you know, the running. You know, the running comment has been, you know, the year that, you know, quote, the year that Kentucky learned how to throw the ball. Because, you know, the last few years you had, you know, you had Benny Snell, you had Boone Williams, you know, you, you know, Lynn Bowden, even when he had to, you know, play quarterback, you know, it was run, you know, left, right, up the middle, and then, you know, throw the ball occasionally. But brought in uh, Will Levis, and you have to credit Liam. And a lot of that is is through from Liam Cohen. And, but then again, you have to give Stoops credit because, he realized, you know, he and Eddie Grant, who was the former offensive coordinator, were great friends. But just that style of football just wasn't, you know, they were winning, but, you know, it wasn't very exciting. It wasn't very, you know, whatever. And so he knew he had to make a change. And he he singled out Cohen, who had worked with um, with the Los Angeles Rams, part of Sean McVay's staff there, and um, brought him in as offensive coordinator. And he promised a war wide open um, more of an NFL style offense. And, and that's what you've had. You still have, you know, Chris Rodriguez, the big man in the backfield. Um, you know, he ran for over 1200 yards. It's your second in the SEC. Um, you, you're still going to get a steady dose of him, but now you've got, you know, you've definitely got those wide receiver threats and um, Wandale Robinson, you know, Iowa big 10 fans probably 
a little familiar with him. Um, Absolutely. He's from Kentucky, he's from Kentucky, played, you know, was Mr. Football here, originally signed with Kentucky, then changed his mind, ended up at Nebraska, then after a couple of years decided to come back. You know, you can draw that what you will, part of it. You know, I think he just wanted to come back home. And, um, you know, yeah, he's just had to an- interrupt, but I think Wandale must be really good at math. Nine and three better than three and nine. <laughs> That's probably what he deduced there. That That is true. That is true. I, I thought Nebraska would be better this year than what they were, but that's, that that's another story for one of your other one of your other it shows. Sure is. <laughs> but um, yeah, 90, 94 catches so far on this season, uh, still with a bowl game to go. Um, set the UK school record for for um, catches in the season, and um, like I said, he's you know Will Levis, and then bringing in Will Levis, um, quarterback, uh, Penn State transfer. You know, it just totally remade this whole offense, and um, it's been. It's it's been exciting to watch this year, and you can't always say that about you know Kentucky. You can't always say that about Kentucky football, but it's definitely been the case this year. Absolutely, I, I you know I, I I hear you talking about uh, Will Levis and and Wandell Robinson. I just fascinated as I'm reminded of the connections here because you know again right off the bat you think Mark Stoops, um, but you know Will Levis was a kid that Iowa really thought was going to be Hawkeye. Um, mm-hmm. and that's right. You know, yeah. he ends up going to Penn state and transferring. And I keep, I said it earlier in the, the, uh, year mark, you remember me wearing blue to one of these shows. It was after the Penn state win, because I said, you know, I got to thank Mark Stoops because if Will Levis didn't transfer to <laughs> Kentucky, Iowa may not have beaten Penn state because as you were, you'll recall, uh, take mm-hmm. Roberson was just terrible in relief of Sean Clifford and Kinnick this year. So, um, yeah, the connection there, and certainly Wandell was absolutely terrific. I'm amazed at what Nebraska can produce as far as receivers, and yet still win three games. But uh, you know, it, it's it's a fascinating matchup, and I've not to just take it all and 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 focus on Iowa exclusively, but I would love to see Mark Stoops be in the top. You know, he's in my top three to four replacements for Kirk Ferentz if Mark is still around and wants to coach when Kirk hangs it up and who knows when that'll happen. I have heard a report. I don't know who was it reported here uh, a month or two ago that um, uh, Mark probably wouldn't leave Kentucky unless it was for Iowa. Have you heard reports about that, Kevin? I mean, is that something that you, is that's not been said, obviously it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not been said, but you, you, you've heard things like that. You know, his, his name has come up with a couple of different things. It came up with uh, Florida state um, I think it's his name's come up with Miami. Um, yeah, I, I can see it. he just signed a contract extension here uh, through the 2027 season. Um, you know, he gets a nice, uh, a big bump in pay, gets big bonuses, of course, you know, for each win, you know, six win or not, it's like seven win, eight wins in bowl games. Um, I, I could see if I, I, I would agree with you, if he ever left, I think the Iowa job might be, you know, might be the one just, you know, based on his history, of course, playing there. Um, getting his coaching start there. Um, I could see it happening, but right now I, I don't see him leaving um, just because of what they have built here. And as I said, you know, second 10 win season in four, um, um, uh, second 10 win season in four, sorry, I was reading the comment there, um, you know, in the, la- in the last four years. But, um, you know, I, I said, I-, I could see that it's never been actually, no one has ever, to my knowledge, actually come out and said that. But um, I, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if he ever did leave for a job. I think that's probably um, would, would be the one. But like I said, I don't see him going anywhere right now. So, yeah. And, and you talked about Kentucky finally being able to throw the ball. That is kind of fascinating to me, too, because, you know, I, I look at a guy like Will Levis as being at least at Penn State. He was a mobile threat more than, than anything. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, am I crazy in saying that? When he was there, now, he, he ran the football primarily. Yeah, you, you're exactly right. And he's and he runs the ball. Um, you know, he has 387 yards, almost 400 yards on the ground this year and has nine touchdowns. So, you know, he, he's not it's not exclusively throwing the ball. But um, but yeah, as as you said, he, he's he's been a very good, uh, you know, a very, a very good running a running option as well. You know, a lot of times those not necessarily an option. He'll just, you know, drop back to pass and then just, you know, finds a hole and just goes and whether those are or planned, or he just does it, um, you know, you'd have to ask him, but, uh, but yeah, no, he, he is, he, he's definitely, uh, definitely a dual threat kind of guy. So. And, and, and uh, you know, we, we talked before we went on the air just about one of the more unique stats, Kevin, 
um, is the matchup of turnover margin. Because, of course, Iowa is one of the better teams in the country in turnover right. margin. Kentucky is one of the worst. How do you how do you how do you go nine and three <laughs> when you're one of the worst teams in FBS turning the ball over? Right. I, I, I'm saying that before you answer that question, let me acknowledge something. The flip side, the Kentucky fans may say, how do you go 10 and two with one of the worst offenses in the country? <laughs> so right. I get I get how you overcome odds. And, and that's maybe right. an Iowa. Maybe that's a Stoops, Iowa thing. Hayden Fryer mm-hmm. thing. I don't know. But how do you do that yeah. if you're Kentucky? Yeah, but you guys have really good defense. So, um, I mean, the you know, so, some people would say, well, it's the schedule. But, you know, you don't, you know, you go nine and three, you know, nine, nine and three against an SEC yeah. um and I, I I misspoke. I, I was giving them ten wins already. We haven't played the bowl game yet, but the possibility of two ten win seasons in the last four years. Um, yeah, it's just it, it's if you if you watch that that to me that's the biggest key in the game is as you say Kentucky is the worst you know one of the worst teams in football. And if you look at that list, uh, the teams around them, it's like you know UConn, Arizona, New Mexico, you know all these teams are one like two and ten or one and eleven, and then you have Kentucky at nine and three. And I think a lot of it, you know, they, they have a lot of turnovers, but they're also the defense has been really, really good to where they can stop, you know, prevent the other team from capitalizing on those turnovers. That's been one of the biggest things. Um, but as, as you said, if you look at the three losses, the one the one, you know, thing that pretty much goes with all of them has been a lot of turnovers. And then, you know, against, you know, they've lost Georgia, the, the Tennessee game that we won't talk about we don't like to talk about up here. Um, and then the Mississippi state game as well. Um, you know, there were a lot of turnovers and then, you know, they like the Mississippi state game, they just caught, you know, Will Rogers on, you know, on a career night, you know, he set the SEC passing record, you know, for completion percentage. And honestly, there was probably no way Mike Leach was losing that game. Um, if you go back a year before Kentucky just totally embarrassed Mississippi state, it was the first time in history and Mike Leach team didn't score a touchdown or excuse me, an offensive point in a ball game. So, but yes, but back to your point, the, the turnovers, like I said, Kentucky's defense, they, they also, they didn't force as many turnovers as they did in 2020, but, you know, they're also very opportunistic and can force turnovers. And so I think a lot of it is the defense being able to keep, you know, keep the opponents out of the end zone, even after the turnovers has been a big key for that. Yeah. And just for anybody that doesn't believe us, this is turnover margin. Um, for the country, as far as rankings, Louisiana La- Lafayette's number one, Nevada's number two, Texas San Antonio, obviously very good team. Number mm-hmm. three, Iowa four, Ole Miss five. You get the, I mean, that is an indicator of win loss. And then you flip that around. Let me flip that around. The worst team in the country at 130 is Arizona, who I believe is one right. of the worst teams in the Power Five, mm-hmm. correct, Mark? Yep, absolutely. Indiana's <laughs> one of the worst teams in the Power Five. Florida International, I have no idea. Are they, they're crap, right? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, not, very they're, not, they're no, not very good. They're not bowl game. They're not very good now. Uh, and then Kentucky. So right. that that's fascinating. And then you go further down the list, you, you know, Connecticut, um, you know, Stanford. Stanford was up and down. But yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. So my question is wh- where do you see Will Levis's game? What do you see them being able to exploit against Iowa? Because obviously obviously you see guys like Jeff Brom being able to exploit Iowa's zone. Uh, and be able to throw it and just throw into it and continue to attack a weak spot. And that's what it's kind of been the formula for a team like Purdue, whereas you see a team like Wisconsin that can just kind of exert its will running the football. Iowa gets stubborn defensively, is not willing to sell out against the run. I mean, they're very stubborn with this zone. And you know Mark Stoops is very familiar with Kirk and this entire staff and how they want to play. So how does Will Levis and, and Stoops, how do they prepare for see, this defense? I, I mean, I could see, you know, draw, com- draw comparisons to both of the, what you said about Purdue and what you said about – um, what you said about Wisconsin, I, I think Kentucky is going to come out um, and try to impose their will. You know, the, well, we we have what we have, you know, here in Kentucky called the Big Blue Wall. Uh, you know, they were a finalist. You know, they won the Joe Moore Award for Best Offensive Line uh, last year, a couple years ago. They were finalists this year. I think I just saw the Michigan before we came on here. I think I saw Michigan won the award. So um, the, what they're probably going to try to do is come out and just run over. You know, run over the Iowa defense. Now, whether or not to be able to do that will, you know, remains to be seen, but you figure you have, you know, Derry Kennard, consensus, all American, uh, Luke Fortner, those guys, you know, try to get the game run game going with Rodriguez. And what, what you see uh, Levis do a lot is those eight to 10, you know, um, they'll, they'll open it up. They'll go to Robinson. I would say within like the first, maybe in the first series, in the first two series, you'll see like the, uh, the long bomb, 
you know, try it with, with Robinson. But what you will see is a lot of that eight to 10 yard, you know, as you said, kind of, you know, zone um, with Robinson. Now, one thing I do want to mention, we talked about this before, uh, Kentucky's going to be without two of their receivers um, before this game. Um, Josh Ali and Isaiah Epps uh, were involved in, in a car accident th- this past week. The the player, the, the, they're, they're going to be fine, but uh, Liam Cohen, came out um, and said that they will not play. They're just going to hold them out of the bowl game just at an abundance of caution. Um, Josh Ali was the second leading receiver this year, 41, you know, 41 catches for 600 yards and three touchdowns. Um, he, he's a six-year – he's a super senior, so his, his career is over. But he was that guy who kind of took some of the um, – you know, kind of took some of the, the stress off of Robinson because he's another guy who could beat you uh, very easily. And then Epps uh, had 11 catches for 170 yards. But uh, what I think, and a guy, a name to watch is Isaiah Cummings. He, he's a, a wide receiver who's turned tight end because Kentucky was short on tight ends. And he's been really good. Um, has been, you know, he didn't play much in the Louisville game, but he's been really good, um, you know, getting open, like in the zones in the middle. So that that's a name for for Iowa fans to watch. So, like I said, I, I look for that eight to ten yard pass. That's kind of where Levis uh, and the guys have made um, have kind of made their living this year with that eight to ten yard pass over the middle, uh, you know, things like that. So I think they'll just try with the run game, uh, see how that goes, and then, like I said, look for that little dink and you know the dink and dunk, you know, eight to ten yard pass and, and um, against the defense. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add one thing. I know that. Uh... You got to get going, um, Kevin. But I will say this: we talked about Wisconsin, we talked about Purdue, and Iowa struggles in those two games. And obviously, there's a formula there. You have one really exceptional unit for Wisconsin: it's the run game. For Purdue, it's the pass game. Iowa does have the tendency, as great as Phil Parker is, and I love the guy. Iowa's stubborn, not just on offense, on defense. So, <laughs> you know, the, the fact that uh, you know you're, you're down some skill position talent offensively be, due to this unfortunate accident. Um, you know that would tell me that I was in a position where maybe you you sell out a little bit more against that run because you're right. Kentucky's offensive line is terrific. They know how to run the football. They got a, a threat back there at quarterback. I I do question whether Iowa will do it. I questioned it before Wisconsin. They didn't do it. Um, and I could say the same thing flipped around for Purdue. So I do think Kentucky's got a good shot shot at winning this game. And I know Vegas obviously thinks they have a good shot at winning this game right. as well. So. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I just for my personal, I, I think I have, you know, I have haven't started on my my preview for the game yet. But yeah, I, I think somewhere, you know, Kentucky. I think it's going to be a pretty close game. Um, I, I think there's going to be, you know, maybe I think going to be less than a touchdown either way. I'm thinking like 27, 21, maybe something like that. Um, is kind of a prediction just yeah, right how, now. How can you? How can either team? I mean, I'm not saying it. I said, I've said the same thing before, and then I, I, met, I, you know, I get washed for it later, but. How could this be a blot either way? Because Iowa's defense is terrific. Right. Iowa's offense is terrible. Like it's going to be very rare for Iowa to blow a team out, unless mm-hmm. what we brought out at the at the outset turnovers become. Right. You know, it's an Indiana repeat or it's a, mm-hmm. a Maryland repeat. Those are the only ways Iowa's going to gain a, a big lead against anybody is if they turn them over exponentially. Right. right, and as I said, that that's been the that's been the one thing in Kentucky's three losses has been the turnovers, and so as you said, that that would be that would, would be a thing if Kentucky goes, you know, you know, Levis throws three interceptions, you know, Chris Rodriguez for all of the great work he's done, and as someone pointed out in the chat there, you know, Kentucky does have a thousand yard receiver and a thousand yard runner, which is the first time in about fifteen years that that's happened. Uh, but he's had a tr- he's had trouble fumbling this year. And his whole time at Kentucky has never had any problems with fumbling, but for some reason he's not been able to hold on to the ball this year. And it's, you know, at some points it's even got to the point to where, you know, they've had to take him out of the game for a while. And then you take Rodriguez out, you bring in Mark's, Mark's guy, Cavassier Smoke, the, uh, the guy with, you know, one of the best name, one of the best names in college football. That's right. Um, you know, he's a great, uh, you know, change of pace back. You know, Rodriguez is more of that power guy. Smoke is kind of that, you know, that, that flash outside, you know, run, you know, Rodriguez will run over you, Smoke will just run around you. And then behind them, you have Juton McQueen. So, you know, Kentucky has three really good, really good running backs who, who will all play in, in the game. So, like I said, I, I think, um, as you said, I think turnovers would be the one reason. And, and it could be the same way if, if Kentucky forces a bunch of turnovers and it could be a blowout. But no, I, I don't think, you know, Kentucky. I don't think I can't remember the last time Kentucky had a blowout, you know, one way or the other in a bowl game. It's always been um, 
you know, down to the last minute, it, it seems like. So why, why should this one, why should yeah. this one be any different? Well, let yeah, me just, just add one, one final thing here, Mark, as sure. far as turnover margin and what Iowa forces, everybody talks, Oh, Iowa forces a lot of turnovers. They force a lot of interceptions. Mm -hmm. Iowa, interestingly enough, is one of the worst teams in the country at forcing fumbles. Now, that's incredible to think about. Iowa has just forced five, or excuse me, recovered five fumbles. Um, and I don't have the number as far as how many they've forced, but they don't force many t fumbles. It's 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 getting a, a quarterback to fall for that zone, and, and they do have ball hawks back there. But um, I don't know. Well, does Iowa have... Do they have the uh, prowess to take advantage of some ball handling issues? That's that'll be a question. Um, I think it's it's a definite possibility because if you look at, you know, if you if you look at Levis's stats, he's second in in the um, in the SEC in interceptions. So with with yeah. twelve, so you know he has twenty three touchdowns, but he has twelve interceptions. Right. So and he he has a tendency. If you watched any of the Kentucky games this year, uh, he has a tendency not necessarily to lock on to a receiver, but he throws the ball so hard that a lot of those interceptions is just simply the receiver, you know, it bounces off their shoulder pads or bounces off their hands. And then the defensive back or linebacker, whoever catches it, that that's where I would say half of the interceptions have come this year because he just has such a rocket for an arm that sometimes a wide receiver can't hold on, you know, can't hold on to the ball. But right. um, but I said that, you know, I said the fumbles, you know, fumbles have been an issue with Rodriguez. But like I said, then, then with Levis, like I said, you know, the turnover, if Kentucky limits their turnovers and plays like they can play, then I think Kentucky wins. Sorry, all the wonderful well, Iowa Hawkeye fans out there. But believe me, just, and but, it's not going to it's not going to hurt my feelings if Kentucky wins this game, Mark. I mean, I, 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 as, as the, the fan in me will be disappointed, mm -hmm. but it ain't going to hurt my feelings. I don't have yeah. anything. And I guarantee you, Kentucky fans are not going to be on our channel ripping right. ripping us yeah. like some fan bases are. Right. So, well, of course, I'm the Kentucky guy, so I'm supposed to say Kentucky's going to win. Yeah, but still, yeah. but yeah, no, I said I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I think it's interesting. You know, even, you know, we've talked about the history with Stoops and whatever that, you know, I was looking at that, you know, Kentucky and Iowa have never played. Um, you know, this will be the first the first meeting ever, which I think, you know, which is the fun thing about these bowl games. You sometimes get those meetings, you know, between schools who have who have never played or not played. I was reading something like Georgia and Michigan haven't played since 1965 or something, which is just, That's you know, for, for, for two programs, you know, of that stature that have that haven't played in, you know, 50 years. Um, but yeah, but Kentucky and I have never played. And, you know, like I said, I, I'm really looking forward to the game. Um, like I said, you know, the, the, the TV, you know, my, my real, my other job, you know, I work at the, the Lexington TV station here, you know, and we're gearing up for, um, you know, pretty much a whole week of Citrus Bowl, Citrus Bowl coverage next week once we get once we get past Christmas. So, um, you know, like I said, we're everybody is really excited. I wouldn't wouldn't expect at least 30 to 35,000. And I know Iowa fans travel, you know, travel well also. Um, you know, when Kentucky played Penn State three years ago, I think it was 35,000 Kentucky fans, um, you know, down there in Orlando. And I would, expect, you know, think that much, you know, uh, Everybody I've talked to, unfortunately, I can't go. I wish I could go, but uh, everybody I've talked to say they all, you know, they're all trying to go. So, you know, like I said, I think it's going to be a great atmosphere. I think it's going to be a really good game. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, you had mentioned, Kevin, uh, that Kentucky typically plays close bowl games, and I did the quick scan through my memory banks, and yes, the Lynn Bowden drive down the mm -hmm. field against Virginia Tech a couple of years ago, of course, against Virginia. Yeah, that was a tremendous game, and uh, just to see uh, a guy take over a quarterback uh, right. for the entirety of the season, we've had many discussions about that. The Penn State game that you allude to, and which Penn State was a top 10 team in the country, and Kentucky was not a huge underdog, but a pretty sizable mm -hmm. underdog in that game, pulled off a close win. It was a really good game. Uh, the Northwestern game, Benny Snell uh, kicked out contra I know I was uh, going to get a shake on that <laughs> one. Um, I think that there was some kind of fourth down. Pat Fitzgerald went for it at midfield mm -hmm. to get it, and then Northwestern had to 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 stop Kentucky, and that was like a 24-3 right. game. Right. Uh, it, it's yeah. It yeah. The only the only one I can remember recently was the um, the first tax lawyer bowl Gator Bowl um, when they played Georgia Tech, and oh, Kentucky yep. just came out totally. They had like turnovers again, turnovers like their first two, first two possessions, I think, and Georgia Tech got up to a big lead. And then they just, you know, ran, you know, ran their little, you know, 
that running attack that they that they are so famous for and just kind of controlled the whole game. That's probably the only one recently anyway that was any kind of a blowout. Even the Penn State game, Kentucky got up like 27 to 7 and then Penn State rallied and you know they had to hold off you know, I think it was Mike Edwards picked off a pass there late in the fourth quarter to preserve the win. So generally when you get to Kentucky, it's going to be, it seems like it's going to be a close game. So it'll be good for TV people. It may not, you know, may not be great for, you know, the fans biting their nails or whatever. But, um, but as I told you guys, just to reiterate, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a fun game. And that was another Nebraska connection there. Diedrich Mills was the star player in the Gator Bowl win. Uh, tax slayer slash Gator Bowl win for Georgia Tech, and then he transferred mm -hmm. to Nebraska right after that. Right, right. All right, Kevin, we appreciate you stopping by. Um, let's see, this game's going to be played on, is it New Year's Eve? New Year's it's Day. New Year's Day. New Year's Day. Yeah. New Year's Day. New Year's Day, one, one, one o'clock Eastern time, I believe, 12 o'clock uh, yep. Twelve o'clock Iowa, Iowa time. So um, Perfect time yeah. for a bowl game. I mean, that's yes, a perfect, perfect, perfect time for the bowl game. So yeah, it, it is. So you can get up and uh, get all your stuff done in the morning and plop down and watch, you know, 12 hours of watch the citrus bowl. And then, you know, everything that comes on afterwards. So, Absolutely. but yeah, like I said, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be fun. I'm really, like I said, I keep saying it, but I just, you know, I'm really looking forward to the game and I think it's going to be, it's going to be a good one. I once sent a uh, email to the head of programming at ESPN, wondering why the citrus bowl and the outback bowl had to be played at the same time two SEC Big Ten matchups. I, I just uh, outlined how frustrating that was. Mm -hmm. They both start at noon or, or, or one Eastern? Yeah, or one... I, I, I think one of them is like noon and the other is a, a, at 1 p.m. So you can watch like the first quarter of the Outback Bowl and then turn over to the, yeah, you know, turn over to the Citrus Bowl. And so. the games are like, you know, they're 45 minute drive. I mean, maybe a little, mm -hmm. a little more than that apart. I mean, one's in Orlando, one's right. in Tampa and Right, you know. it's like eighty miles or something, or sixty. And they're miles also like involving that, yeah. the same conferences, so you have more of a, a likelihood that there's going to be people that want to see both games. Yeah, that's fair. But absolutely, Kevin, we got a few last word on college football. Everybody, head on over there, check out uh, Kevin and the rest of the crew over there that does such great. Uh, work for us and contributing to what we do here, the voice of college football. So Kevin, thank you so much for that. Merry Christmas to you. Yes. yes Merry Christmas. To you guys, thank you so much for having me on today. I really, really, uh, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, th thanks again. And like I said, you guys have a great holiday. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Thank you. All right. We're not done yet though, Mark. I see Bob, Bob says, bye guys. Don't leave yet. We're now we're going to talk about uh, all of Iowa's misgivings. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I did want to address something before uh, before we, we get on. I saw the real Hayden said he wants to send you a Hawkeye helmet, and he wants to know how to get in touch with you. Okay. So uh, I'm going to uh, throw that to you. This must be the season of giving because I must have seven or eight people that want to get me helmets, which I appreciate greatly. Uh, let me set up a P.O. box. I'm in the midst of doing that don't want to give out any information that i don't want to give out so therefore we're in the process of uh and so i'll be able to do that so uh hayden you can contact me at uh, mark rogers tv at gmail mark rogers tv at gmail and we can take it from there but thank you so much for that yeah and a couple things for iowa fans the iowa women lost at home today to iupui um blew an 18 point lead uh uh, 16 or a 15 point lead in the fourth quarter and lost. So we got the, the day off started off nicely. And then right now my pick for the, the uh, potato bowl, Kent state is losing to Wyoming 35, 24, although Kent mm. state now inside the red zone uh, anyways, but uh, I've seen a lot of chatter about the, the depth chart. Uh Oh, did we lose Corey? For just a second, hopefully he'll pop back here real soon. Corey was going to address the depth chart, and we see that a number of you are also interested in the quarterback situation. Corey, you back with us? Yeah, I don't know why my internet's been doing that lately. Once in a while, it'll just drop off completely. No worries. Um, so, depth chart released today, a couple notes. Ivory Kelly Martin, who had lost really any role on this team offensively, is number one, is number one of the depth chart at running back which of course was interesting because Tyler Goodson leaves. You kind of assume Gavin Williams comes in and fills in, but you know, Tom Caker and I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I was not going to be surprised if, 
if Kelly Martin got a run. And it's nice to see him back on the one line. I hope he doesn't fumble in this game. You know, that would be a terrible way for his career to end because I don't think he's coming back next year. So it'd be nice. He's been a, a heck of a uh, leader on this team and, and was really a leader during the offseason uh, issues last year. So if he can come back, if he can play in this game and play well, I think he's a good runner. He's he's definitely a good runner. He just had fumbling issues this year. That'd be nice for him. Um, and then we saw Gavin Williams and LaShawn Williams on the depth chart as well. Spencer Petrus is listed as a starter, much to my chagrin. I don't I don't agree with that, you know. But again, I'm not there every day in practice. So if I was if I was making a decision, I would start Alex Padilla based solely on upside. I mean, it's the bowl game. What do what, what do we what do we have to lose at this point, Mark? I mean, I, I just, I don't understand it. So, but again, I'm not one making decisions and, and uh, I'm not ripping anybody for it. I just don't agree with it. Um, and sort of an interesting development and maybe Mason Richmond is banged up, but Jack Plum is listed as the starting left tackle. And if anybody watched the big 10 championship game, and I know Jack Plum had to go up against the best defensive lineman in the country, maybe the best player in the country in Aiden Hutchinson, but Jack Plum looked, didn't look very good. I'll just say that. I, you know, I don't take a personal shot at the kid, but I, I'm shocked that he's at left tackle. So that makes me think there's got to be something going on. Although Richmond was listed as the backup at left tackle, so that's odd. Um, and then Nick DeYoung is listed as a starting right tackle. So, but tackle doesn't look real strong right now. Um, and there's not a whole lot of movement anywhere else. The only other note that I that I saw in this depth chart, and again, things will change. They've got. I mean, I don't even know really how much they've worked on Kentucky. I don't think they've really worked on Kentucky at all yet. But, you know, you look at at corner, and, of course, Matt Hankins is out for the bowl game still with an injury. Um, Terry Roberts is nowhere to be found on this depth chart. And so you've got Riley Moss and Jamari Harris as the starters. I don't know if Roberts has got an, a serious injury now, if that's what what's happening. That would be very disappointing for him. Um, because I know he's been, again, one of the better, one of the more underrated players in this entire roster, what he's given on special teams and when he's had to play defensively. So those, you know, those three things stand out. And I tweeted about those earlier today, but, uh, yeah. And as far as back to the portal news, I know we talked about the quarterback position last, uh, last Tuesday, as, as you know, I'm sure today, um, so He's off the board for um, Iowa. Not that he was ever really on the board, but uh, he's gone. Um, I'm hearing more and more about Calzada to Pitt, although nothing's been confirmed there. We know Bo Nix is is going to Oregon. He's off the board. Um, Adrian Martinez is going to Kansas State. There was a rumor. I want to address this. There was a rumor on Twitter several days ago about Adrian Martinez and how Iowa was really in on him hard and wanted him. I, I, I'm no media member, Mark, as you well know. I, I, I consider myself a talking head. But but you reached out to the, the contacts you have. I did the same. I have found, I have talked to nobody on the Nebraska side who's been able to substantiate the idea that Iowa went after Adrian Martinez. Now, maybe they did. I would be very surprised by that. But rumors, as you know, start on social media, you know, at the drop of a hat or on message boards. So I wouldn't read into that. I have heard nothing else, nothing, as far as Iowa being involved with any quarterback, okay? And as I continue to say, to go after a quarterback, if you're Iowa, you first have to recognize that you need to go after a quarterback. You have to recognize that you have a problem at quarterback. And I don't know that Iowa believes it has a problem at quarterback. I believe it does, but I don't know that the coaching staff does. Maybe they do. But... um, you know, guys are going off the board. And if you wait till after the bowl game, if if Spencer Petrus is a starter or Alex Padilla is a starter and quarterback play suffers in the bowl game, and you say, well, well now we need to go to the portal, it's going to be too late. Most of these guys are going to be gobbled up and you're not going to have options. So if that's the mindset, it's not, I don't think that's, I don't think that's particularly um, smart or, or uh, I, I just don't think that's the way to go. I, I will say this, uh, as you know, Rex Burmeister's in the, the portal now from Virginia tech. Yes. He was not great. His completion percentage wasn't great, but man, the kid ran for a lot of yards. If you look up his stats, uh, he does run the football at quarterback pretty well. He was a starter. So another power five starter enters the portal and he had a better, um, a better pass efficiency rating than any Iowa quarterback. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on Burmeister? I know you, you have some Virginia tech guys and you, and you do some work with the, with Hokie football. 
Yeah, I've seen him play four or five times um, this past season, something in that range. Uh, yeah, it would be difficult for me to rank him against Petrus and Padilla. I think it's fairly close. It's not as though you would be bringing in somebody that, okay, they are going to be the starter. Uh, it would be a competition. But uh, certainly, he's he is uh, much more mobile than than Petrus and decidedly more mobile than Padilla. So he brings that dimension. Uh, and, and you're hitting on the two topics that people most want to hear about based on what I reviewed in the live chat. And that's number one, they're not happy with uh, the depth chart naming of Spencer Petrus as the starter, number one. And number two, wondering why all these quarterbacks are shifting teams all over the country and pretty high level of quarterback too. And that Iowa seemingly is not interested uh, with a offense that ranks around a 100th in the country and quarterback along with offensive line being the main culprits. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, the real Hayden, I know. So he commented in the chat and I'm not saying you're wrong, Hayden, but he commented in the chat that Sean Callahan was the one that reported that. I keep hearing that, that Sean Callahan of Husker online was the guy that reported that Iowa was after Adrian. I have not been able to see that. Is that in an, uh, uh, an article that he posted, a tweet? You contacted Greg Peterson, who works with Sean Callahan at Husker Online. He said he'd heard nothing of the sort. So I have not been able to personally contact Sean. I have reached out to him. I have not got a response, but yeah, I, I don't. It, it would be hard for me to believe he reported it. that. Yeah, it would be hard for me to believe that um, that, that was a uh, an item on Husker online and Greg Peterson not being aware of it being posted. Uh, he works directly yeah. with Sean Callahan every day. Right. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that happened and, and maybe we're, maybe we're wrong on that, but um, yeah. And I don't know, Burmeister again, good runner, definitely not at the top of my list. I, I'd be at going after Calzada right now. Um, I'd be going after the kid from uh, I'd go after Thompson at Texas. And here's what here's another thing we have to remember. And I brought this up to you, and I've I've I even brought it up to Don Patterson the other day. I was talking with him on the phone, and um, I mean theoretically, right now two four seven sports is predicting that Thompson uh, from TCU and or Texas ends up going to TCU. If that were to happen, I would have to think there's a chance that Max Dugan from TCU transfers. Maybe I mean that's kind of how this works now. As you will recall, Max Dugan was a pretty high recruit on Iowa's radar from Council Bluffs. He's, he's an in-state kid. You know, I I know when I talked to you about this, Mark, you thought that maybe that's not that great of an upgrade um, as far as a passer is concerned. Um, he's he's definitely a, a much better runner, I think, than either guy Iowa has. And he his numbers are, are, are pretty good. I mean, they're not great, but they're pretty good. I'll tell you, a kid who I'd go after uh, – if he entered as a portal, a kid that I got on the TV screen right now, Dustin Crum mm. for Kent yeah. State. I mean, he he fits the Iowa mold. He he, he kind of reminds me a little bit of CJ Beathard with how he plays because he's not he's not the greatest athlete in the world. He kind of lumbers down the field, but he's faster than you th I think. He's a better. I know. Again, we're talking totally different levels of football. We're talking Mac to Big Ten, but as you will recall, Crum played pretty well against Iowa. He played against a really good Texas A&M defense. I know they didn't score a lot of points in that game. They played Maryland. But if you want to uh, know a, a pretty good stat line for uh, Dustin Crum at Kent State, 64% completion percentage this year, nearly 3,000 yards. It's going to be at over 3,000 after the bowl game today, uh, over eight yards per attempt, which isn't you know outstanding. That's better than anything Iowa throws forward. 145 passer rating, 16-6 to six touchdown to interception ratio. And here's the other thing. Other thing, Iowa would get – you could grab a kid like this. Crum has ran for 633 yards and 11 touchdowns on the ground this year. So that's something Iowa doesn't have. And Padilla is – I think some fans have made Padilla out to be this um, dual-threat quarterback, and he's not. He's more mobile than, Sp than Spencer is, but that's because we're used to watching a stature in the quarterback. Alex Padilla is a more mobile kid, but he's not a dual-threat guy. And guys like Burmeister or Crum, these would be – Dugan, they'd be upgrades as far as the run game is concerned. And I'm looking at um, Dugan, Duggan. I've always gone the Duggan route, but anyway, uh, 
he's coming off a 64% completion percentage year as well. Yeah. Which I, much better I think than Iowa. A, yeah. Petrus has been what in the 56 range, 56, 57. Yeah. At one point he was 60 and it's been steadily going down. I mean, he, he the numbers would say that Spencer Petrus has um, gone backwards from, from last year. So, you know, maybe you want to say it's, it's better competition. They had to play a better Wisconsin team this year, a better Purdue team than last year. But I, I just don't think he's, probably improving all that much. And we've talked about it. Iowa quarterbacks typically don't improve a lot from year to year. So the good indication here with Dugan is that he's thrown anywhere from 227 to 339 passes. So it's a good sample size for three consecutive years. We're talking about over 800 pass attempts in the big 12 and his completion percentage has gone up decidedly every year from 53 to 61 to 64 his TD to pick ratio has improved every year. His yards per attempt has improved six one to seven five to nine flat. So there's yeah, almost, development. Almost all these guys that I'm looking that I've looked into as far as guys who have entered the portal or could possibly be entering the portal have improved from one year to the next. And that's kind of how it's supposed to work when you develop players and they get older and you know whatnot, they get used to the system just doesn't really happen at Iowa. It has in the past as far as the numbers are concerned. Uh, again, we brought up Stanzi improving from one year to the next, but they lose more games. Same thing with Vandenberg and go down the list, uh, C.J. Beathard. But again, a lot of these guys play actually better when they're taking more chances. Uh, you know, I don't know. We could talk about this till we're blue in the face. I'm kind of worn out talking about it. Um, I, I find myself thinking, of you know, every time a guy enters a portal, I'm thinking, you know, in reality, it's probably a waste of breath because I think the bottom line is there's a good chance Iowa doesn't go after a quarterback. I would love for them to surprise me. Um, you know, and I'm not saying any of these guys are the answer. I, I do know people have, have said, well, what's why can Pitt be because Pitt has been connected? Was it Slovis that they were connected to? Yes. Pitt's been connected to a couple of kids. And you may say, well, what does Pitt offer? Well, Pitt did go and they win the ACC. Yes. Am I crazy? They, so they win the ACC, they got a Heisman finalist that helps your chances at getting another quarterback and and Pickett's going to be I think fairly highly drafted so um you know Iowa doesn't Iowa can't say that I mean they go to the the Big Ten championship game but they, they don't have a history of producing quarterbacks to the league so that is a, a a negative check mark if you will just take Pitt in general so Pitt has brought in an offensive coordinator and I don't want to mispronounce um or th not pronounce, but not think properly. I believe it's Mark Whipple. Anyway, bring him in. I think I've got that straight. I'm, I'm aware of his work, but not coming up correctly with the name necessarily. But you just wonder, I consider Iowa to be of a higher status in college football than Pitt. Pitt has been going seven and five pretty much forever since the mid to late eighties. They've been a seven and five program and they can decide during one stretch, Pat Narduzzi comes in, of course, he's a defensive-minded guy, that they're going to revamp their offense. They, were, they went from being the most run-heavy Power 5 program in the nation outside of the, well, in the Power 5, I was going to cite the military academies, of course, not in the Power 5, to the, the, one of the more pass-happy. And not that being pass-happy is the, the end-all, be-all, you you need to build an identity and the run game is extremely important in that and should be for any team that achieves success. There has to be balance. But the point being they reinvented themselves. They brought in a first rate offensive coordinator who had extensive work in the NFL. And then they, they take a Kenny Pickett. You talk about development. He was a game manager type and who just got better and better and better and better. And they didn't have these crazy outstanding recruiting classes. They had something in the range of what an Iowa would, would bring in from a talent standpoint. And here they have a prolific offense. Now I would say the defenses in the big 10 are better and Pitt would not be producing these kind of yardage and point totals in the big 10, but they would be still a productive offense in the big 10. Absolutely. And I, I don't, I, I saw the, the comment from Andy and I just checked this while we were on live it was confirmed. Pete Thamel just reported that officially is officially headed to Pitt. And part, Pat Narduzzi just posted on his personal Twitter account, "Welcome to the Pittsburgh family." So, 
Keaton Slovis is a Panther. You're going to have a video to do after this, Mark, I'm sure. Um, so congrats to you. But, you know, just another one off the board. Another one, and, and, and the question, John, did we ever try to get Slovis? I'll let you answer that question, Mark. Did Iowa try? Do you think Iowa went after Slovis? We don't know. I mean, we don't know for sure. We, we can't we say don't know for sure, but there's typically enough that gets leaked out there that yeah. we have a pretty good idea. And the teams that I uh, had heard Slovis linked to were uh, Nebraska, Nebraska, Cal, Stanford, Pittsburgh, and Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. Yeah. Yep. Those are the ones I heard as well. So um, never heard anything about Iowa. And you would think that maybe Iowa, I mean, he plays like an I, he plays like, like Iowa quarterback just better, right? Like he's got a really good arm. He is sort of a statue. I'm not saying we want a yeah. statue here, but like that's sort of how he, he would fit the mold. So, you know, whatever. I, I just, <laughs> I just, you know, the the guy, like I said, the, we're going to get to the end of, there are going to be some guys who I'm sure enter the portal because we, perfect example, Burmeister wanted to play. He wants to play in the bowl game and his coaches told him, no, you're not playing because he entered the portal. So there are going to be situations, I'm sure, where some of these quarterbacks want to finish the season with their team and then enter the portal following the bowl game. But here's why I feel, I don't think that's going to be, there's not going to be an onslaught of entries because it's just like with early signing period, the clock is ticking on all these guys. And that's why all these players like Burmeister felt the need to enter the portal now, because if you don't, you very well could not have a home. You might get left behind. So you know, when you slide, when, when, when one variable slides everything up, it, 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 it creates pressure on everybody, just like with early signing day. Um, and so if, if you're a, if you're a quarterback and you don't, you don't go with the flow and you don't go early, then you could get left behind. If you're, if you're a school and you need a quarterback and you don't go after somebody early enough, you could be left behind. So the danger here, even if Iowa does think well we we might need to go after a portal quarterback but we're going to wait till after the bowl game you're going to get left behind uh and i could see maybe iowa throwing out you know this would probably be more reasonable that iowa goes after a kid like crumb that enters the portal uh i'm not saying that uh that crumb's entering the portal but that could end up happening in january but boy it'd be nice to go after a a proven guy at this level you would think a guy like Dustin Crum, who's had the kind of experience and success at Kent State now in a third season at Kent State, in which he's been one of the better quarterbacks in the MAC. I believe he won the Offensive Player of the Year in the conference this year. Maybe looking at his NFL future, thinking, hey, I got to go Power Five route, prove what I can do there, and uh, would be looking for that opportunity. Certainly wouldn't surprise either one of us, I don't think. Uh, the only common denominator I'm coming up with all these teams that are pursuing transfer portal quarterbacks is that they all have much better offenses already than Iowa and they are still pursuing <laughs> transfer quarterbacks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good news, I guess if there's any good news, if we want to, if we want to continue to live in La La land and, and I've, I've lived there before Mark, it's a nice place, but if, if we want to continue to live in La La land, let's just acknowledge the fact that Slovis going to pit means Calzada is probably not going to pit. Sure. So Calzada's on the board, folks. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You know. So, what, what were your thoughts when you heard that that Miller committed to Florida? Were you surprised at all by that, or had that been reported? I hadn't really followed his recruitment very much. Uh, I, I didn't know what he was looking at or who was looking at him. It doesn't uh, necessarily surprise me. He's um, he's rated as a guy that would be able to, you know, compete for a job at a place like that. Um, that's an interesting situation that is in line with what you just talked about. Uh, Emory Jones is playing for Florida in the bowl game and he is leaving the transfer portal. So that's a rare situation where a quarterback has stated I'm leaving, but they're still allowing him to play in the bowl game. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, how does he play? I haven't really watched them at all this year. How does Emory Jones play? Oh, he's a runner. He yeah. is a, a better throwing Denard Robinson. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, if that's the, if that's a, uh, if that's true, then, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of guys that should be on the list right now. Yeah. I don't see Emory Jones being an Iowa fit. He just doesn't seem like what, he would. What about Rocky Lombardi? 
Let's go get Lombardi from Northern Illinois. He's an Iowa kid. Did he not, play? Not to, not to back up on this, but Emory Jones. Emory Jones did not turn out to be a, any great quarterback, but good enough to start at Florida and shoot started in an SEC championship game last year. He was he was highly sought after. He was a five star. He originally committed to Ohio State and committed later to Georgia before he settled on Florida. So he is talent. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Mark, uh, Rocky before, Lombardi. Yeah, R Rocky Lombardi. Before we before we change the subject, uh, I haven't watched much Northern Illinois football. I did watch him in the bowl game. He looks like the same guy he was against you know at Michigan State. He can make yeah. unbelievable plays, but he can also just completely fall apart. He he's an athlete. There's no question about that. He's a heck of an athlete. So they had a seriously run heavy offense. I think even in that game, they must have run the ball like ten times before they let him throw it at all. And his his numbers are pretty pedestrian. So I would just be conscious of just bringing in another um, form of Spencer Petrus. Yeah, um, I do want to hit before we before we uh, tone this show down. Uh, and I guess if anybody's interested, yeah, uh, Kent State's looks like uh, in trouble. I guess it's an, it's down to an 11 point game. Boy, Wyoming has just stormed ahead. It was 42 to I believe 28, or 42 to 24 a second ago, but it's now down to 11. Um, but as it relates to the re this past recruiting class, you and I haven't really talked about it post signing day. And Mark, I, I told you when we were talking last time out, I said or two times out, I guess, two times ago, I said, um, this class is going to be better than people think. And, you know, you may have looked at me and said that you're just being a homer, but I looked at stats and, and I know 247 and Rivals, they they rank schools based on recruiting classes. And Iowa ended up in the top 25A, um, and at least by one or two of the rankings. But they also moved up more than any other team, I believe, in the top 30. They've moved up on signing day like 14 spots, at least according to 247 Sports. That's really, really good. So signing day was excellent. I know that's been now, you know, we're, what, a week and a half or two weeks almost uh, removed from that. But uh, there is some good – there are some really th good players to be excited about coming in this next spring, even if Iowa doesn't go out and get a bunch of transfers or a transfer quarterback. Um, there are some really good players in this class. Caleb Johnson reminds me – now – Let's pump the brakes on this. I'm going to make a comparison. It's not, you know, lose our marbles, but reminds me a little bit of a guy like Braylon Allen. And more that's mainly because he's he's that size. He's six, he's like six two, six three, two twenty-five at running back. He's a big kid. Um, now, again, will that translate? Not everybody can be Braylon Allen or Derrick Henry, but for anybody who's watched a guy like Derrick Henry, he's not that much bigger than Caleb uh, Johnson out of Ohio. I think Derrick Henry, I want to say, is 6'3", 230. And, and Johnson, from what Kirk said during his press conference this past week, he's 6'2", 225. So, again, that doesn't mean he's going to be the next great thing. But it, it is intriguing. He's got the size coming out of high school, and that's something Iowa has struggled with with some of their better athletes you know, in the backfield, Akram Wadley, Tyler Goodson, getting these guys big enough to where you can – run between the tackles consistently. That's something to be excited about. And and I've said this entire period that one of the guys I'm most excited about seeing is Jazzy and Patterson. And I've heard people say, oh, he looks like Tyler Goodson. He does not look like a Tyler Goodson to me. I know he's 5'10", 190. He plays a lot bigger than he is. And if they can bulk him up, he can be a smaller version of maybe Caleb Johnson. But it's interesting. I went back and looked at how he ran and I thought, you know, he kind of reminds me just how he runs of a little bit more of a, a um, agile Sean Green. Um, and again, all the comparisons were Tyler Goodson, but Sean Green was actually forgot. Sean Green was 5'10", 190 in high school and he bulked up. He gained like you realize that when he was with uh, Iowa, I believe his senior season, he was like two. I want to say like 230. He gained like 40 pounds from the time he was in high school to, to uh, his great 2008 season. So I'm not saying Jazzy and Patterson will do that, but Patterson has the ability to not only make guys miss, but also stay on his feet through contact, which again is something Iowa running backs have struggled at times doing. And they've had to relegate themselves to this lightning and thunder thing where we have a oh, Goodson and Gavin Williams or Akram Wadley and LaShawn Daniels 
So I'm hopeful these two running backs coming in next year can kind of be those tweeners, but they're built differently initially. So they'll have different strengths, but I think both of them, um, both of them are, are better all purpose backs than, than maybe we're used to here. And the other guy that I'm really excited about seeing, and, and this is a guy who's more flown under the radar is Addison Estringa, uh, tight end at a, at a Wisconsin. I believe he was ranked by rivals like the 1200th best player in the country. And I had a discussion with them about that. And we kind of laughed at it because he's a really good athlete. He was going to play baseball at Iowa. Iowa got him to flip to football. Um, so I'm excited about him. There's just a lot of good things in this recruiting class. These are two good classes in a row. Um, you know, and that's not even talking about Aaron Graves, who's going to be, I think, really good. Obviously, Xavier Wampa. They had some really good defensive backs. They got laid in TJ Hall and Cohen and Tringa. So uh, lots of things to be excited about. Um, I don't mean to just focus on quarterback. Obviously, that's where all your personnel starts. But uh, And then the other day, Mar- um, I think it was two days ago, um, news broke that, um, is it Mac Markway, the Florida tight end commit for 23, is a four-star kid, wanted by everybody, decommitted from Florida. And, of course, his dad played under Coach Don Patterson in Iowa in the 90s. Um, his cousin played, I believe, at South Carolina, so there's there's – you know, speculation that he could end up a Gamecock, but there's also speculation he's a St. Louis kid that he can, could end up committing to Iowa. And of course, they got some time to recruit him as a 23 recruit, but good things happening still in the recruiting trail at this point. And uh, already several commits in the 23 class, they'll get more and they've got some momentum right now. So I can see why Kirk, at least at this point, sounds like he's planning on coming back for at least a couple more years because his coaching staff, and I, he's got to be given some of that credit, has done a really nice job with recruiting here here lately. But as far as the here and the now, that's why I keep bringing up quarterback. The, the, these issues here and the now, like next year, are not going to be solved with the 21. Some of those issues may be solved by the 21 class last year. And if they can develop spring and summer of next year, that can certainly help the line. But, but per, they got some other personnel issues other places. Justin in the chat is having fun with my Denard Robinson comparison with Emory Jones. Um, I'm not going to go into further explanation of why that makes sense, but I'm also not going to say that I sat down and watched tape of both quarterbacks for three hours before I made that statement. I just picked a name off the top of my head. So let's not take it too seriously. All right. So Dave, uh, let's catch the super chat before we have to take off. I heard that Zach, the backup quarterback from the University of Minnesota, is in the transfer portal and was interested in Iowa. Um, Dave obviously doesn't want to take his shot at uh, Zanikstead uh, in terms of spelling. But uh, Zach Zanikstead would be the guy that I would assume he's talking about from Minnesota. Who's well, there's, I, in the portal. I don't know. There was another backup that was at Minnesota that was recruited by Iowa that's in the portal. There's two backup quarterbacks at Minnesota, but I didn't know that I, I didn't think Anikstead was recruited by Iowa at any point. I could be wrong on that, but it was the other quarterback from, I don't remember his name. He's never played, but he was recruited in the 2019 cycle. So unless Dave's getting it confused, I might be getting it confused, but um, Jacob Clark would be the other Jacob Clark. Right. So I don't know if Dave's unless, unless Iowa was interested in Anikstead and I'm not aware of that, but um, Jacob Clark, and I haven't heard anything. Again, he hasn't played, so there's no reason to think I was going after him, or should. Either one of them. Yeah, Zach I mean, Alex Dad lost his job, so, you know. It's not like, you know, it's not like Tanner Morgan has, you know, set the world on fire. Exactly. If Zach <laughs> Annex said can't beat out the Tanner Morgan we've seen the last two years, why would Iowa want him? I, I don't right. know. Yeah, I agree. All right, folks, uh, we appreciate uh, everyone being here each and every Tuesday. It's uh, 4.30 Central Time, Hawkeyes Live. Corey Brad makes this thing work. You can catch him for men's and women's basketball coverage as well as Hawkeye football over on From the Hawkeye of the Storm. Let me pull up the banner here and, uh, again, track uh, Corey's work over there. Yeah, post game tonight, Mark, uh, after the Iowa basketball game which, by the way, was on BTN Plus, and now it's been moved because of a COVID cancellation. It's been moved to BTN. So Iowa, uh, CELA, southeastern Louisiana, will be on BTN at 7 p.m. Central Time. We'll be going live with Coach Gary Close at 9 p.m. Central Time. So join us over from the Hawkeye of the Storm on YouTube. 
I would encourage everyone to do that unless like me, you ignore basketball season and then you will, you will catch uh, our work on Nebraska live in just about 20 minutes on the Nebraska channel. And then we've got a special uh, live stream coming up tonight at 830 Georgia, Michigan live stream on the main channel, 830 Eastern with like seven or eight media guests coming through to give their take. All right, Corey. Well, Thanks for making this work, and uh, we will see you back here next week. I guess I should say this. I was going to announce it, but um, myself, Coach Don Patterson, right here on the Iowa Channel, Sunday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Sunday, 7 p.m. Central Time. So people have been asking, when's Don coming back on the show? There's your answer. Sunday, 7 p.m. Central Time. We'll take calls and and talk Iowa, Kentucky, and the portal and everything. So be, be there or be square on Sunday at 7 p.m. Central. Excellent. We'll see you all next week.